Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I am proud to have joining us Mike Panaggio, the owner and founder of DME Academy, located in Daytona Beach, Florida. And I know what you're thinking, Corey, is this a pop-up academy? It's not a typical prep school. And the answer is you're correct. It is not. It's very atypical. And that's why I wanted to have Mike on is because he himself went to Deerfield back in the late 60s. His son went to Worcester Academy before playing D1. And he's a great businessman. He's lived the prep school world. He and his son played college ball. And in 2015, he started DME Academy from scratch. Um, And it's right next to his marketing company, which we talk about, that does a lot of work for college athletic programs. But he is doing things differently. He is focused on excellence. He is focused on uh, making kids well-rounded, handshakes, how to do, um, how to talk about themselves, how to talk about where they come from. It's a different type of situation, and that's why I wanted to get him on. It is not a pop-up academy. Mike and his brother Dan, who's a former NBA assistant coach, are not making money off this. They are putting everything back into this program, and it's beautiful facilities. They've got a top 100 player right now in their program. The Murray twins, who are both in the NBA, both went there. Um, Mike's one of the most interesting men I know in basketball. I've had a lot of kids go to DME over the years, and they've enjoyed their experience. They got a lot of teams. They got a lot of kids to place, um, and I press them on that on how they do that. And and it's it's an answer like you you'll hear from nowhere else. So thinking outside the box is what I always like when it comes to basketball. When it comes to life, and Mike is one of the best at it. So. Anyway, enjoy my conversation with Mike Panaggio of DME Academy here at the Prep Athletics Podcast. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Mike, welcome to the podcast. Well, Corey, thank you. I've been looking forward to uh, being on your podcast because you do such a great job. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. And uh, I want to start off. You went to prep school yourself growing up back in the day, and you went to Deerfield Academy. And this was in the late 60s, early 70s. How did you even hear about prep schools, and how did you know to choose Deerfield? Well, my father actually had suggested it because – you know, I had done whatever I could do in the local Rochester market and um, had some pretty good luck, both academically and athletically. We were, we had won 39 out of 40 games. And he said, my father was always, Mike, you got to be challenged. And so um, a good friend of his had his son go to Deerfield. He was a swimmer, really enjoyed the relationship. And uh, we went up and took a drive up in uh, February of 1969 in a huge winter storm. And um, somehow we decided that we would, uh, you know, take the shot. I I liked what I saw, the challenge, the 500 boys and competition all around, everybody looking to to, uh, really excel. What's one of the big takeaways, aside from athletically, but your prep school experience there at Deerfield, like what's one big takeaway you got from it? Well, you know, there were 500 boys. Uh, There was, there was a a time when there was no, um, you know, there was no cell phones. There was no girls. There was, there was nothing to distract you. So, you know, I, I had 10,080 minutes a week. And my God, at Deerfield Academy, you used just about every one of those minutes efficiently or you didn't keep up. <clears throat> so my takeaway was that um, that effort is something that you choose. And it's, not, it's never going to be, they never allowed that as an excuse for failure. You know, it's your effort. And they really taught, taught us about, you know, the choices that we had. And... Uh, I went to school with kids that were all pretty much exceptional. And that's, that's been, I think that I could look back at that experience and say that that was the turning point in my life. And it, it opened my eyes and it, it made me believe that if I were to give effort to everything that I did and not accept 
being tired, for instance. I mean, you get everyone gets tired, and a lot of people quit because they get tired. And um, they taught me that um, that uh, excellence is something that requires sacrifice and a different level of intensity. And I bought in, and I still buy in every single day. And that's what we preach up here at Deer. At Deer this is what we preach at DME Academy. Now, did you see the movie The Holdovers yet? Yes, I did. It was I. That's I saw pretty it much during the time you were at Deerfield. <laughs> well, it has Deerfield. That's right. It has Deerfield uh, scenes in it as well. I recognized when I saw the movie. I had no idea what I was watching, and uh, I saw Deerfield, and I said, "My God, that's Deerfield Academy!" So uh, it was a it was a good surprise. And that took place during the Vietnam War, which is when you were there. So that must have been pretty trippy seeing that. Yep, I was there 69, 70, and 71. The school started in 1797, so it has a long history of, of excellence. Now, when you left Deerfield, you went to SUNY Brockport, and you had a heck of a career there. And the question for you, Mike, is how did you get so good? Well, my dad was a basketball coach. And, um, you know, if you wanted to be with dad, you played basketball. And so I just hung around the game my entire life. And it was an interesting story how I got to to Brockport. Um, in 1971, the NCAA changed the rules on freshmen playing varsity ball at the college level, not the university level. You know, for instance, Bill Walton and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at UCLA, they had to play freshman ball. <clears throat> Pete Maravich had to play freshman ball. So when I signed a letter of intent to go to UMass, where Julius Irving was and Rick Pitino, uh, which was only about eight miles away from Deerfield, I had signed a letter of intent to go there, um, I would have played freshman ball the next year. So being the math whiz that I am, I said to my father, who didn't want me to come to Brockport originally, I said, Dad, but I'd get four years of varsity basketball. And to me, Every minute, every game is special. And playing freshman just is not really, you know, uh, the excitement that playing varsity ball is. So that's how I got to Brockport. And, um, um, you know, I did my best and had a good career. That's interesting. That freshman year, your math, math calculations in your brain is what kept you from playing with one of the greatest coaches in history and one of the greatest players in history. So that's interesting math that you did there. Well, you know, I also had been away at Deerfield for several years. <clears throat> I was a big family kid. I'm the oldest of six and uh, loved my family, all my cousins and aunts and uncles that were more like uh, fathers and mothers, second fathers and mothers to me. Uh, so I was uh, pretty anxious to get back home and looking for just about any excuse. Plus, my dad, very special to me. And my dad was always a winner. And so I played at Brockport. We played in two Final Fours. We um, had a good string of uh, big-time wins, and um, I enjoyed the experience. I wouldn't change it for anything because I had four years of special time with my dad. You know, uh, we went we went to war together, and uh, it's something. Not only was he my dad, but now he's my coach. And that gave us the type of relationship that most kids could only dream of. Yeah, that's great. Now, when you graduated from Brockport, you did a couple of years in the financial industry, and then you started a company called DME. Tell me about that company and, and what led you to start it. Well, <coughs> excuse me. I, um, <clears throat> when I was at Deerfield, believe it or not, there was a number of kids that were getting the Wall Street Journal, and they would get it for free. So I said, hey, what the heck, I'll get it for free too. So I started reading it and got to where I was trading, you know how you trade fake stocks, you know? So I'm buying Eastman Kodak and buying Xerox and pretending I actually have money into it, which I had no money into it, but I got really hooked. And so that when I graduated from Brockport, the first thing I wanted to do was go into the financial market. I wanted to trade stocks and commodities. And that was 1970, like 1976. And um, that was it. I got hooked. So I worked in that nice, industry. But then talk to me about DME. Like, well, how did you get to 
start that company and where'd you get the idea? Well, when I came down to, um, when I came down to Daytona beach to help some customers that were in the, uh, they were part of my financial group there at Merrill Lynch. Um, I, <clears throat> I helped them get out of the, you know, out of the problems. I came up with solutions for them and they were all marketing solutions. And these were being handled by companies that did that for a living. And I looked at what they were doing and I said, you know what? <clears throat> I can do a better job than them. Now I knew nothing about print. I knew nothing about marketing, but I had a lot of fundamental common sense. So having no fear and having lots of confidence, I just took it on. And I said, this is what I'm gonna do. Started off very small. And um, before you know it, I had, you know, DME was born in 1982. And in our first quarter, first three months, very proud. We had no negative cash flow. It was just myself and two other basically kids. And um, uh, I was 100% owner. We had an $88,000 profit. And we were off to the races. And I always put every penny that I made back into the company to make it a bigger company. And uh, today I've had some pretty pretty darn good success with it. Yeah, and when I came down to visit DME, you took me to the business side and kind of showed me the marketing stuff <clears throat> you do for universities. Uh, talk to me about how you got into that and what you currently do and what kind of products you do make for universities. Well, the university market is a vertical that is right now <clears throat> very much in need of assistance because uh, there's a lot of, talk out there that college is not worth it. The college, in effect, is a scam. And uh, kids are not getting um, getting the, the dollars or the cents or the or the uh, the value that they they really, you know, should be getting. Um, so there's a lot of needs for help. But, you know, my belief is that college is an extremely important part of, of growth. Every one of our kids, 99 percent go on to college. We believe in it wholeheartedly. And, um, of course, you know, you've got to have the right attitude uh, for college. But we got into that vertical because it was um, it was something we felt we could really contribute to. And we are. And so we do a combination of things. We started off just helping with uh, promotions for, you know, game day promotions for big college football schools. Uh, every SEC school except for Vanderbilt is one of our customers all the Big Ten schools. We have 260 universities that we work with, uh, not all in the same way. A lot of the private schools we work with helping them get students mm. because they're, they're having you know extra challenges. But um, we love that college vertical. We love the people we work with, they're good people. And um, you know we're prospering greatly with it. Yeah, but let me let me go back to what you said about college. You think it's a great idea. Let me give you a scenario here, and let me get your thoughts. If you get a scholarship through sports, which you're obviously dealing with on a daily basis, that's a great deal. But if you're a kid that's potentially going to go two hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt, and maybe get a humanities or liberal arts degree, what's your thoughts on that? Is that still worth it? Hmm. Well, it depends on the family situation. But if you're going two fifty into debt. You really got to think about it. You really got to think about it. You know, one of the one of the new classes that we're teaching today is a passion for excellence. That's the name of it. And you're looking at the new teacher right here. No certificate. <laughs> I have no no certification, but we're having a our, our first class tonight. Sixteen young men. We're talking about entrepreneurism. We're talking about right. excellence. And I'm very excited about it because uh, the class starts at six o'clock. It's right next to the studio, the green screen studio we have. And it's, it's about presentation, building confidence. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of big time entrepreneurs that never went to college or never right. finished college. And uh, it's really up to the kid. Uh, I do believe that there's a lot of opportunity to mature in college, develop relationships, but I really double think it if I'm going to go into debt two hundred fifty thousand yeah. um, dollars. Yeah, I matter of fact, that would be something that I probably would caution against, unless there's a special need. Going to become a 
a medical professional. My daughter went to Duke. You know, I paid the way for her to go to Duke and then to med school and then residency. And she became a doctor. And, um, you know, I've got another daughter who went, you know, at the end of uh, her junior year in high school. She was a very, very good basketball player. Tells me she's going to New York. She's skipping her last year. She's graduating early. And she's going to go to the New York Conservatory for Dramatic Arts in New York City, which costs even just as much as college costs. But that was that was her thing. And now she's in Berlin. She's a singer songwriter. Uh, and I've got another daughter who went to Stetson. And she feels that that was a waste of her time because she's now an entrepreneur. But, you know, that's what kids think. You know, there's but there's there's so much that they gain. The friendships, the the relationships, the maturity, the the ability to um, to almost effortlessly um, communicate that that's a key. So I'm a college guy. I believe it did a lot for me, and I we recommend it to every one of our kids here. Gotcha, gotcha. Now you're doing great with DME, the marketing company, and in 2015, you and your brother decide to start DME Academy. What what caused this? Like, what was the seed that sparked that said you wanted to get into this? Well, the business had been, you know, the actual the marketing business was changing. It was going to more digital. So it means there was less need for uh, warehouse space <clears throat> and big giant printing machines. So we went to laser and all digital. It gave us a 40,000 square foot warehouse that we were using. I was using for my kids to you know, practice and play basketball. I had a couple of arena basketball um, uh, nets up, you know, actually the, the, the full, I don't know what they call it, the, the, uh, just the arena baskets. I had a couple of them in there. And my kids would come to me, uh, they would come to work with me. They loved coming to work with me because they could play ball and all their friends would come to DME. And that's an interesting situation as well but um it just we started to build dan had worked for the lakers for four years and so what we decided to do is eh, let's instead of having a cement court let's go ahead and put a wood court so we had a small wooden court and then we just kept going so the small wooden court ended up becoming two more full 94 by 50 professional basketball courts great lighting great baskets. You've been there. Everything we've got is just first class. And it really was patterned after the Los Angeles, after the Lakers um, practice facility. You know, they haven't caught on yet. We have big Laker logo in the middle. Not quite exact the Laker, but but it is, uh, we, um, we celebrate the Lakers, which Lakers have always been my favorite team. So, and that's how we, that's how we got into it. We, we, uh, we started with the basketball, um, saw the benefit. They gave us some additional ideas on how we could do it, partnered up with a few groups. And before you know it, uh, now we're totally on our own. We do our 100% of our own academics, all our own recruiting and training. And uh, we're pretty proud about the intensity at DME. We really are. I mean, you don't come here and lay around. And we don't let you lay around. We, we make sure that you're working to potential because we owe it to the parents. So that's how we got into it, sort of by mistake. But then again, you know, it's a, it's a very grateful mistake. We are thrilled, thrilled to be in this business. Love it. Yeah. And what makes you guys different from other prep schools or academies? <clears throat> what's, the, what's the special sauce that DME has and that you guys offer? Well, It's a fact that we, we know every kid, you know, I, ha I have ownership in other academies as well, um, <clears throat> small ownership, but with DME Academy, we've got 46 different countries represented. And I think if you come on this campus and, and you've seen it, I know these kids, I pay attention to these kids. Um, I have, I, I'm, I'm not saying it's all me because we've tried to pass my genes on to others, we, <clears throat> we take a very deep interest in every kid. It's our, we take it as our responsibility to help them reach their potential. 
And it's not about whether they win or they lose on the basketball court or the soccer field. We want, we just don't want effort or lack of effort to be a reason for disappointment or loss. You know, I always say five years from now, Jimmy or whoever I'm talking to, you know, your handshake is going to be more important than your jump shot. So it's extremely important that we start putting those ideas into their head because <clears throat> we want them to be successful on the hardwood, but we really want them to be successful in the boardroom. That, that's really what the goal is. And that, that comes from confidence. And so the classes, like what I'm teaching right now, is all about presentation and making them comfortable. And they'll tell you, well, I don't like to get up in front of people. I said, but you can get up in front of people and shoot a one and one with 5,000 people screaming at you. You have no problem there. Yeah, but I practiced. And I said, exactly. You need to practice. There's no difference. Everything you do must be about practice. You must have a passion for excellence. And that takes intensity. But most of all, it's commitment, determination, focus. And uh, that's really what we're, that's what we're all about. It's a long-winded, you know, value proposition. But um, we're never going to get very big. I mean, we're about 250 altogether here with, with a little bit more than 100 kids locally. Um, but our international kids, boy. I'll tell you, I put them up against anybody. And I'm not talking about on the hardwood. I'm just talking about in the boardroom. We just got some great kids, great personalities. They want to learn. They uh, don't waste a bunch of time. <clears throat> and uh, I have a blast every day with them. I really do. Now, when you're looking at players to come <clears throat> to DME for the basketball team, especially from other countries, are you looking for their talent in the court? Are you looking at their character and kind of their personality when you're interviewing them? Or is it kind of a combination of everything as far as you're concerned? You're right. It's a combination of everything. I mean, they have to, they have to fit in. And most importantly, can we make a difference in this kid's life? That's, that's, that's the big deciding factor. Um, we want to make sure that, <clears throat> that we can have a chance at them reaching a level of excellence. I mean, when you think about it, there's, there's five choices these kids have. They can be bad, which doesn't take much effort. They can be average, which is sort of what most kids are. They can even be good. He's a good ball player. He's a good student. He's a good son. But you know what? Over time, good turns into invisibility. You really don't notice good. What you do notice is exceptional. <clears throat> and as we talked about, that's our whole focus. Can I help this kid reach exceptional status? And that takes into consideration a whole lot of different attributes, not just his jump shot, not just his vertical. As a matter of fact, oftentimes, if that's what you focus on, you're going to be very unsuccessful because the NBA is just, a, it's a dream. It's a point zero zero one. Very rarely do we have kids like the Murray brothers that come through DME, <clears throat> you know, and, and keep in mind what happened with them. They came as post-grads. Why would somebody with that type of talent, you know, go to a po do post-grad unless they had massive injuries or something like that? It was because they just hadn't been discovered. What they needed, talk about value proposition, was they needed a place where they could get into the gym 24 seven, where they could get up 500 shots a day, where they could become, where they could believe in themselves. And the Murray brothers, as well as many other kids have that opportunity because we're not, we don't tightly guard our gym. It's not like you can't get in and it's not like a, a local school where talks about insurance and that type of stuff, no. You have access to that gym. We applaud you. Don't waste time. Yeah, you know, we even look at their, their routine. You need a routine. You can't just come in and shoot. You need a routine. You know, like Steph Curry has a, has a great routine. We copy Steph Curry's routine. 
All the kids are doing his inside out type moves. And, um, <clears throat> you know, so that's, that's another difference. We are very, very serious about everything that we do. And it comes from the top. It comes from myself and it comes from Dan. Um, if we're going to do this thing and work so hard for no paycheck, you know, it's it's going to be, we're going to make sure that we do the job right, because that's really our reward. A reward for a job well done is a job well done. Yeah, love that. Now, you've got a top 100 player mm -hmm. in your program now. You had the Murray Twins come through, who are now in the NBA. How do you find these players, Mike? Well, the Murray brothers, um, you know, oftentimes it's, it's fluke, you know. Who knows? Um, if you, you're going to have to read the book, okay? Because the Murray family machine being announced first on Corey Heights podcast is going to become a reality. We are part of the talents that we have at DME delivers is writing books. <clears throat> and um, we finished one for uh, Vince Carter and his mother. We are finishing one, very close to finishing one for Bismack Biombo, who has an incredible story from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And we have started the book on the Murray family machine, which is going to be an absolute blockbuster. Um, they came They came to us. They didn't want to come to DME. They were going to go to a JUCO. The father said, come on, let's go down, check out DME, check out a few other prep schools. They came down. They did a workout with my brother, Dan. Uh, Keegan actually, yeah, it was a little bit soft. He threw up he, he, after the workout. He, the workout was that strenuous for him. And, um, and the father said, this is what you need. And so they made the decision <laughs> to come down. And those kids had a routine, 500 shots a day, every day. Um, other kids, how do we get our kids? We do showcases all over the world just to show the brand. Um, we were in Qatar this year. We were in, um, we're back and forth to Jordan all the time because of um, the Jordanian head basketball coach, Wesem Al Sous, um, is was our first post-grad coach here. As a matter of fact, he coached the Murrays. Um, we were in Qatar, uh, I said, said Qatar, Dubai this year. We were in Pama de America, we were in Barcelona, and we were in uh, Luzon, Switzerland so far. And we've got several others that we will do. And we wave the flag. Uh, kids come in for a, uh, we always recommend kids come in for just a three-week trial. Come on in and go to summer prep. It's a three-week camp, and it gives them a feel for what they would be getting. So give them a chance to test it out. And also it gives us a chance really to examine whether it's somebody we'd like to invite to DMA Academy on a full-time basis. And it's got nothing to do with your talent. It has something to do with it, but it's not everything. It's about can you, can you handle being away from home? Can you handle the rigors of academic excellence? Can you handle um, social fitness? Because that's our goal. Three things. Academic excellence, athletic performance, and social fitness. Those things are, those are the key. Let me ask you about social fitness with cell phones today and people being away from home. How do you foster <clears throat> social fitness at DME? Boy, I'll tell you, these, these cell phones are very difficult to break. Um, kids don't understand that you speak with your eyes. You listen with your eyes. And when you've got your eyes you know, focused on your cell phone all the time, it is, it's, it's something that is going to be a problem. Now, I don't know how to solve it. All I know is that we talk about it. They're not allowed in the gymnasium. You came up, you, you know that we don't allow those in the gymnasium. You could bring yours, but <clears throat> the kids can't bring theirs. The, um, you're not allowed in the classroom. They have it in their dorm rooms. Uh, my class tonight will be making fun of cell phones, you know, because let's face it, you know, I grew up in a, in a period where there were no cell phones and we did okay. We, we did okay. 
I mean, now it's every single, I mean, you get on an airplane and as soon as the airplane stops, you got, you know, 80 people. We just landed. Okay. I mean, useless information that I really believe is detrimental, not only to these kids, but to the entire population. Over communication is not good in my opinion. Yeah. You know, I took my nephews a few years ago to Fork Union because uh, we we're looking at prep schools for them. And Fork Union has a no cell phone policy. They can get them when they go on road trips. But my nephews turned green. And when they heard that, they were just like, I don't want to hear anymore. We're, we're done with Fork Union. <laughs> and they couldn't hear anything else. It just freaked them out. And, you know, they've got camps now where kids go out in the woods. The first couple of days, they're, they're in withdrawal from the phone. But then they start to enjoy not having it around and all the consternation it causes. So I think we're in for a big sea change here in the near future, Mike, with cell phones and with being phone free. Um, I think we're getting to a tipping point on that. So thanks for sharing what you guys do with that, because I'm curious because every prep school handles it differently. Some prep schools allow, you know, phones in the classroom. Some they're not allowed oh. in the academic buildings. And it's a big problem these days. No, I know it. So... With that being said, is there anything specifically you took from your experience at Deerfield that you incorporate into DME? Well, they taught us to speak in absolutes. In other words, um, words like "I will try," not really accepted, and they would they would not they sure. would frown on that. And you know what? There's a there's a great scene that I use all the time from Hoosiers. You know, 1986 historic basketball film probably the best one out there and you know it's uh there's 19 seconds left on the clock the score is 40 to 40. gene hackman draws up a play he says jimmy we're going to use you as a decoy buddy you're going to run the picket fence igor you're going to take the shot from the corner and the kids just no conversation nonverbal communications they're nothing they're all they're all they it looks like they had a, a bad taste in their mouth they, they had mustard or something whatever it was they're just all just just looking like they're just getting sick and then gene hackman says what's the matter with you guys what's the matter and jimmy says after a long pause he says i'll make it yeah. i mean one of the most iconic lines of all time and so we use that a lot at DME because there's multiple ways to interpret, I'll make it. So when we talk to the Jimmies and the Buddies and the Johnnies and the, and the Genies about it, we ask the question, are you confident, confident enough? Are you going to make it? Because you have to say it, I'll make it. I'll make it not only in basketball, I'll make it in life i'll make it in math class i'll make it at home you know in switzerland with my parents because we do teach that as well the 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 thankfulness you must have for your parents for what they do for you we don't you know we're sensitive we 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 see through the entire process and what it takes and how important the parents are and so our relationship with the parents is extremely, extremely good. Last year, I think I mentioned to you, uh, my wife and I visited 22 different families, you know, throughout Europe and the Middle East when the kids weren't there. We just were on a trip through Europe and visiting families. And I'm going to, I doubt that I'm going to be able to do that many this year, but I'm on my way to Europe soon and I will visit families over there because it gives us it gives us a, a, a great look into their life and right. the hospitality that they show. The only problem with doing that is last year I gained 10 pounds because these families are just so hospitable and so thankful for what we do. And when somebody is very thankful for what you're doing, what do you do? You even do it better. You even, it just encourages you to step your game up and i think if i took one thing really away from from prep school and what we try to teach it, it here at dme is that each and every day you have to have the mindset of an athlete you must attempt 
to get better in every phase of your life, every single day. And if you can do that, just imagine what you can become. They say that if you just spend 18 minutes a day, every single day, up to 100 hours, you'll be better than 95% of the world in that category. So it takes a focus. And I want our kids to have that advantage, to understand <clears throat> how good it feels <clears throat> to, be, to be excellent, to be elite to be exceptional, as opposed to how it feels to be average, bad, or even good. And that's the message that I'm trying to get across. And you've sat with me in Denver and other places, and my message doesn't change much, does it? And um, I'm going to continue to do that because I love being here. I love being in this position, being able to impact these kids. And I love what I think we, what we do for these kids. Yeah, and I I don't know any other place, uh, I'll be corrected if I'm wrong on this, where someone like yourself goes overseas and visits families like this in their own house. And you also have kids over to your house for dinner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> quite frequently, too, which is not the norm. And you get to really know them and mentor them, which I think is just unique for an, a, an owner like you um, to do this. It's It's just, it's not normal. So I commend you for that, Mike. Well, you know what? The reason I really do it is I love doing it. I mean, the kids are just right. so full of, of excitement and, and you just learn so much and it makes you feel young as well. And so um, just great kids. And I think that, you know, I've always said in my regular business that there's no such thing as a bad employee. There's only bad managers. You hired the employee. It was your choice. And now you're disappointed and you want to blame it on them. No, it was your, your fault. And I think it was us too. There are no bad students. We choose them. And there is, there's a process that we go through. Uh, we're not 100% acceptance here by any means, like many prep schools are. Um, we want to have the right family at DME. And we want them all to participate and be confident and never be fearful of, that's one of the side effects, you know, losing your fear, learning how to speak and, and, and not being afraid to um, to make a mistake, because perfection, in our opinion, is a delusion. It just doesn't exist. But it's not a bad target, not a bad target, because even if you don't hit it, you're still, you know, you're still up at that upper echelon, like a Kobe Bryant. Kobe wanted to be the GOAT. He wanted to be the greatest player of all time. Did he make it? I don't know if he actually made it. Most people will say he didn't. But darn it, he came so close, and he was in that rarefied area that, what's the difference? He'll be remembered for centuries as Kobe Bryant and what he did and his work ethic. Yeah, that's commendable. And Mike, I just want to say that like you're different than most places to where you're nimble, right? You and Dan and the leadership can make decisions quickly. You went to a New England prep school. Your son went to a New England prep school. You're not doing this to make money. You'd like to win a lot of games and, and get a lot of notoriety, but that's not the most important thing to you. Like you're trying to help as many kids as possible with the leadership. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to get you on here is to, to share this vision and to share what you do for these kids, because it's not, it's not normal. It's not normal. And I think you're one of a kind out there. And uh, I think it's a very intriguing option for a lot of kids. And then you get other stuff like this, right? And for those of you listening to the podcast, I'm holding up two decks of cards here <laughs> that Mike gave me in our last visit. I mean, explain this to people and, and just one of the things you offer. Well, I tell you what, it's best to just maybe just show. Can you see? <laughs> yeah. There's 50 decks there. So I write books on subjects like leadership. Great coaching. Uh, we've, I've got three or four different decks just on DME now. And, um, and instead of writing a book with a whole bunch of fluff in it, a lot of redundancy, I decided that I would just pull out nuggets, quotables. You know, in our DME deck, it's, it's a bunch of simple things. One of them, perfection is a delusion. Um, always be ready. Always be on time. 
You know, find the passing angles, find the right shot, things like that. That's the book. It's 54 of those things. But many of the, much of the wording has double or triple meaning. Find the right shot. What the heck does that mean? It can mean many, many different things. And so I enjoy writing these books. And now I'm writing these books for others. I just wrote one for, for Bismack Biombo and his foundation. Um, I've got a lot of different academic subjects, too, <clears throat> on Africa, on Europe, on Asia, because with 46 different countries, what we've done is we've actually, we actually created an app for DME that is a competitive app that, that helps you learn the countries of the world and you compete against each other. So, of course, I don't want to be a fraud, so I know all the countries of the world, exactly where they are, and I've gone further because you always, you never can be satisfied. Go further with everything you do. So I learned all the capitals of every country, and now I'll miss a few here and there, but uh, now it's the populations and the learning about each country, and what, what the kids do, also, they have they have to prepare for the sort of the Scott, I call it the Scott Drew interview, you know, where they walk in, they get ambushed. They come into the, the room and knock on the door. They shake hands. They don't even know who they're shaking hands with. And then I announce, hi, I'm Scott Drew, head basketball coach from Baylor University. Welcome to our campus. I'm so excited, Jimmy, to have you here. But before we go on a tour, why don't you sit down and tell me a little bit about yourself? Myself and the coaches, the assistant coaches, would love to hear a little bit about yourself. Now, they get ambushed. They don't know Scott Drew. They don't know, um, you know, Baylor University, but they have to talk about themselves. And there's four different takes they've got to do. So the other area that they, they, they talk about and they have to do their presentation on is their home country in front of other students. And then the kids get to ask questions. And what you do is you make friends because they get a chance to learn about your country, learn about your city, learn about your exports, imports. So in a sense, you become a teacher, an expert teacher on Switzerland. And that's, that's great interaction for these kids. And at the same time, they learn to present. So that's one of our little methods. I love it. And that's just not normal. That's not, that doesn't happen in most other places. Um, you know, you played for your dad in college. And now flip the tables, your son's now coaching at DME. And before he got to coaching, he actually went to Worcester Academy. So you had your experience at Deerfield. Talk to me about your process with your son, Matt, and why you chose to do prep school for him and how you came upon choosing Worcester as the best fit for him. Well, <clears throat> I let Matt make his decision. I didn't. He, he, he had had a scholarship offered to him to Lipscomb University which at the time was in the, um, yeah, still is, it was in the A-Sun. Um, he felt that, um, that being on the team was great, but he wanted to have plenty of playing time. He had a gap year uh, available to him. And so we went up to New England and we looked for different schools. We went to Deerfield, <clears throat> we went to Tilton, we went to Worcester. And um, coach up there at Worcester uh, had quite the personality and um, had eight kids. His name was Jamie. I can't remember Jamie's last name, but good guy. Yeah, Jamie Sullivan. Sullivan. That's right. And um, he had eight kids that were Division One kids. Matt had a great team, great experience. And um, he, um, I wanted to give him that chance to have that one year to mature. And um, he really enjoyed it. And, I'm, and he could have been other schools. Uh, he didn't go to Deerfield because their basketball program there was not the level that Worcester's was or Tilton's was or Exeter was. And so that's, that was his main focus. He wanted to get really strong competition before going on to college. And he did well, did well. And where did he end up going after? Uh, he ended up going to Mercer. And um, 
he, okay. he went to Mercer. He spent two years at Mercer and um, then transferred to Henderson State. And the reason that he transferred, which I was against, you know, but he makes his own decisions. Um, you know, he, he was playing in just about every game. He was playing in basically every game. But he said, Dad, I'm never going to be captain. I'm never going to get 35 minutes a game. You know, uh, it just wasn't how they played. And I want to get 35 minutes a game. And so he transferred and played for Jim Eglis over at um, Henderson State. Had uh, a great career there and um, met his wife there. And uh, now he's got two little boys and, uh, you know, lucky Matt. So Matt had um, no regrets at all. And he has become a very mature top-notch coach. He's been around coaching his entire life, his grandfather, his uncle. And, um, of course, I can't teach him anything because I'm his dad. That's how it is with dads. Right. Uh, but uh, very proud of the, the job that he's doing. And he is of the same ilk as I am. We teach the kids first. The kid, The most important thing with our with our kids is that they learn. It's not about just about basketball. It's about becoming socially fit and ready for the next level. You know, our job oftentimes, uh, coaches are just too full of themselves. You know, for God's sakes, you know, high school basketball, nobody remembers much about high school basketball. They remember college basketball in the professional ranks. They remember what you do after high school. Um, most of this will be forgotten you know, within, within a few years, but how and what effort you put in the efforts that you learned, the social aspects of what you learn will never be forgotten because they'll be ingrained into a, into a habit. And that's what we're trying to create here. Habits and habits are contagious as well. You know, as we know, you know, kids that are, are, are confident and strong, it becomes it becomes contagious with everybody. And that's what we try to we try to push. You know. Love it. Now, help me on this, Mike. You've got multiple teams there for basketball. How do you explain that to families? I'm sure most kids want to play on the main team, mm -hmm. but you've got secondary teams. Talk to me about how that process works of putting who on what team and how that. that gets well, I got that from Deerfield as well. Um, we. At Deerfield, we had multiple teams. And I think we had five basketball teams. At, at DME, we have 13 basketball teams. And we, uh, they pretty much play the same system, all of them. Now we have girls teams as well as boys teams, but mostly boys teams. Um, we don't have the typical, you know, the local high school, uh, they got 15 kids on the team. So you know what happens. You played ball, dissension, I'm not playing. I feel inadequate, you know, when I'm 15, 14, 13, 12, and the coaches focused on winning. Our coaches are not focused on winning. Our, 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 our coaches are focused on um, helping the kids perform and learn, reach potential. So when you have nine or 10 kids on a team and you're running a full court press the entire game, well, guess what happens? Everybody plays. Everybody has to play. You know, if there's any foul trouble or anything, everyone plays. But the, the, um, we have a national team that travels all over the world. We have a regional team that travels all over the um, East Coast, United States, Southeast. Then we have a, um, three post-grad teams um, that do their fair share of travel as well, and they're playing about 40 games each. And then we have um, three high school teams, typical high school teams, um, blue, gold, and black. And then we have um, two middle school teams as well, because we take sixth, seventh, and eighth graders um, from the local market. And so it's, a, it's, pr it's pretty great. aggressive. Everyone is treated the same. You could be on the, what is considered to be the, the lowest team, you know, a middle school team, but you're treated the same as the national team. Um, same type of access to the gym, same quality of, of, of uniforms, equipment, and coaching. 
Now, Mike, that's a lot of kids that you got to place, a lot of postgrads, a lot of 50 or seniors. What's your placement strategy? Is that up to the coach? Do you have a recruiting coordinator? A uh, combination. Um, we've developed a program called Best College Match. It's an internal program, and this helps us match kids up, give them an idea. And we start matching kids up in their junior year. I mean, it, you know, to wait until second semester, like most schools, just absolutely irritates me to death because we've got to start getting ready for college placement junior year, filling out FAFSA, filling out the common app, getting your, um, getting your, um, your essays completed, understanding what makes sense. I want to be a biology major, but I want to be in a warm state. Well, there's no sense in a, applying to North Dakota State. You know, it doesn't even have biology. So, you know, I, I don't know if they do or not, but um, you, you get the, the drift here. Um, <clears throat> the coaches are involved with placing, but we can't leave it to the coaches. You know, we're all involved with placing. And um, sometimes it's, you know, you get a kid who wants to play basketball, but they can't. But they have the academic strength of going to a – you know, University of California, Berkeley. And we got a kid this year who cannot play, but he wants to play. But instead of going to a JUCO in Kansas, he's going to the University of California at Berkeley, a top five academic school. And sometimes we have to pound on the parents to say, we've got to make this choice because your kid is too young. He doesn't realize the power that he will get in his basketball career, you know, he'll sit on the bench, you know, at this JUCO out there. He's going to have a terrible situation out there. So we have to be forceful and we have to advise as opposed to waiting for it to happen. I mean, a public high school, mm. I mean, they don't, they don't do much of this. I mean, they're not, they're not, they're not pushing their kids in the right direction. Well, we do. And I think that's one of the big value propositions for us. I'm available. I talk to kids about it all the time. Uh, Dan is. We have somebody full-time. That's all they do. And we develop software to help our parents sift through the 42,000 grants that are out there as well. Each kid has their own website as well. And that's under our, mm. what we call our HSR, you know, we've, we have HS Sports, which stands for High School Sports, which is for team programs. And then we have HSR, which is high school recruiting. So each kid at DME has their own website. They're not charged a penny. It's sort of like an NCSA program, um, except for it's, it's free to our kids. And um, it's focused on basketball and soccer right now. Love it. Thanks for explaining all that. Last major question. Where do you want DME to be in five years? <clears throat> you know, I am thrilled where we are now, but the the focus has always got to be to get better. So we're working on stronger academics. I want to be able to have kids coming from all over the world, but I want our kids to be able to go all over the world too, because I have done considerable uh, travel all over the world. I spent you know, the last three years going to Africa. And um, although the Democratic Republic of Congo, where I've chosen, is not the first choice for, for, um, for vacationing, it is a choice to, to have clarity with reality of what, what the world is all about. So I want our kids to get a glimpse into what the world is all about, as opposed to what TikTok tells it's all about. And so I want to I want to continue to have more and more showcases around the world. I want our kids participating and I am hiring kids that have graduated from DME now. We've got a kid from Tunisia. He is absolutely a superstar. When he came here, he came here for three years. He couldn't even speak. But I gotta tell you what we noticed that other schools don't. He had terrible acne. I mean, it's not something you want to talk about. And usually you just, hey, that's up to the parents and that's up to 
somebody else. I took this kid to a dermatologist, <clears throat> got him prescription, cleared up his skin, and he became the homecoming king at the at the prom. He was a, a, a leader, captain of the basketball team, and I'm not saying it was because of his skin. I'm just saying that there's a lot of little factors that you have to notice. And when you're when you're going after excellence, every single detail has to be examined. You know, to really be an exceptional school. And I and I, I know we miss a lot of them. You can't get them all. But I'm going to tell you, it's not because we, for lack of effort. Our 168 hours a week, our 10,080 minutes, our 604,800 seconds are all focused on making this a very great situation for our kids. And not it's, it's not about us. It's about them and their families. And that's why we do it. I think there's no better place to end than that. Mike, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. This is, uh, you know, I've, I've admired you since the, the first time I went down to DME and met you, and you've taken care of a lot of my kids that have chosen to go to DME, and they've all got great feedback as well. And you're not a typical prep school, right? But that's okay. You're atypical, and you do things your own way. And I think a lot of people that had questions about DME are now going to have them all cleared up, and then some after hearing this conversation. So I really appreciate you. No, and I that. appreciate you having me on. You know that I reached out to you because when I get your newsletter and I hear what comes out of Corey Heights, I say, this guy really knows what the heck he's doing. Your message is pure. It's aligned with what we do. And our relationships are only going to grow because you're first class. And I'll tell you, more kids should listen to what you tell them to do because you're, and it's not all about DME. You send kids all over the world and all over the, you know, New England and so forth. And I have a, just a tremendous amount of respect for you and what you do. And you know it because I've come after you about that. And I love your, I love your newsletter. Keep pushing out that great advice. And you know what? Maybe you and I should write a book. So that's the, that's the next Let's one. Let's do it. We'll, <laughs> we'll talk about okay. that offline. Thank you, Corey. Well, Mike, thanks so much. And everybody, if you enjoyed this, be sure to subscribe on all the podcasting platforms, sign up for the newsletter that Mike just mentioned on prepathletics.com and subscribe to us on YouTube. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time on the Prep Athletics Podcast. Thank you.